Welcome to a new lesson of heat transfer. Today we continue our discussion of numerical methods for heat conduction problems. And specifically we're talking about how to implement boundary conditions in our uh, numerical methods and also two different kinds of methods of solution. So let's start talking about boundary conditions. Of course we have different kinds and let's see some cases. The first is, of course, a Dirchlet boundary conditions. So for this kind of boundary conditions, uh, the temperature is specified at the boundaries. So this is our discretized domain at I equals zero. So on the left side here, the temperature is specified and it's equal to T surface zero, T S zero. Instead, on the end of right end of the domain, the temperature at I equal capital M minus one, the temperature is equal to T surface L, T S L. So this is the simplest case. Instead we can have a Neumann boundary condition. So in the case of Neumann boundary condition, we know that instead is the heat flux that's specified. To do that, we have to rely on a energy balance. So we take a control volume and the control volume here has a thickness, which is delta X divided by two. Where delta X, remember, is the distance between two um, adhesion points on the grid. We have um, specified heat at the boundary, heat flux, Q, S. And we know that there's some heat generation E inside the domain. On the right part of the control volume, there is, of course, heat conduction because heat is conducted away through the domain. So by carrying out uh, energy balance, then we can relate the QS, that's the imposed flux, that's known, heat flux, the heat generation, note here, then we multiply by delta X divided by two because that, that's the thickness of this control volume. And then <clears throat> this is the conduction term by Fourier's law, where, which involves T1 and T0. A special case is when the heat flux is specified at the boundary, but that's actually zero. So we have adiabatic wall. So dt dx is equal to zero. In this case, we can use the analogy with the symmetry condition. Because in this case, so here we have the zero derivative of the temperature with respect to x. This is the adiabatic wall. This means that we can imagine we can have a fictitious grid point on the other side. And the temperature, if this point existed, would be exactly symmetrical with respect to the adiabatic wall. So what we do, we write the differential equation at, posi at the generic position first. So remember this, this discretized form of the second derivative of the temperature with respect of x. And we substitute the value, value of the index uh, zero. Actually, this one should be I equals zero. Discretized form then takes this form. And because of symmetry, the, the temperature at the fictitious point minus one, so the temperature T minus one, it's equal to Ti because the temperature profile is symmetric with respect to the line of the adiabatic wall. So if we arrange, we substitute this here, we rearrange, we have the condition at the boundary. When in general we have heat generation, but there is no heat conduction through the adiabatic wall. Let's see now we, how we can apply the finite different methods to, to our problem. 
Let's take the case of plain wool. And to simplify even further, let's say there is no heat uh, generation. So we know that at any index i, we have this form of the conduction equation. So this is the discretized form of the second derivative of the temperature with respect of x. And let's look at how this equation, discretized equation, looks for at each point. For example, i equals zero. Let's say we have a discretized sorry, Dirichlet boundary condition, so the temperature is specified, Ts0, that's a given one. At i equal 1, all we have to do, we have to go back to the original equation here and put 1 every time we see i. So we substitute in there, and we have this algebraic equation. i equal 2, exactly the same thing. So i equal 2, we substitute 2, where we see i in the equation, we get another algebraic equation. So what are we doing here? What have we done? We have transformed our differential equation, actually an ordinary differential equation in our problem, to a linear system of algebraic equations. So we don't have a differential problem anymore, we have an algebraic problem. We have a system of equations, the algebraic equation, they are linked to each other and we can have thousands of algebraic equations. So the more points, the more grid points we use, the larger the capital M, remember the number of points we use for the discretization, the more equations we have to solve. Obviously, we can use a simple substitution to find a solution to this linear system of algebraic equation. So what do we do? We write the algebraic system in matrix form. So matrix A multiply a vector T equal to a vector B. So A, the matrix A is what's called the matrix, matrix of the coefficients, that's known. T in an array vector that contains all the temperature at each points. And so this is the unknown vector and on B is instead known. So let's look at this system a bit more. So if you use the discretization procedure we use up to now, the matrix coefficient will look, look something like this. So we have a one here because we're using uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. So one will multiply T zero, that's equal to Ts zero. That's a specified temperature at location I equals zero. And then for each line, we have um, the coefficients that define the discretized conduction equation. And so as we go down, we move down the matrix, we have different location i. So this term here, for example, multiply t, t0. The second term here multiplies t1 and so on. So we have what's called block diagonal matrix. So all this on the diagonal, all the terms of the matrix on this diagonal are filled with coefficients, whereas here is all zeros. So another zero here, zero, and here, also on this part of the matrix we have zeros and we have a one down here because we need to specify the Dirichlet boundary condition on the other side when at m n minus one location. So we have well posed algebraic system of equation. How do we solve it? Well, we can use direct methods. So what's a direct method? It's a method where the matrix can be inverted. So we have T equal the inverse of the matrix A times B. So we find T and T contains all the numerical data we need because we have the temperature now at each point. But what's the problem with this approach? Well, if the matrix is too large, then we bump into numerical issues. It can take also a very long time. 
But if you have a small uh, problem, so the discretization does not involve many points, this is a good, good idea. If we start, instead we have many points M, capital M, then we can rely on iterative methods, like the Gauss-Seidel. I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, but the Gauss-Seidel methods then involves these steps. First of all, we have to rewrite our system of algebraic equation in this form. So we take the first equation and we solve for T1. So T1 would be a function F1 of all the other temperatures in general, the unknown. T1, T2, all the way to Tm minus 1. The second equation instead is solved for T2, function of F2 of all the other temperatures, and so on. Once we have written this, what we can do, we can guess. So we give an initial guess of the temperature, all the points, all the grid points in the domain. So we guess T1, T2, all the way to Tm minus 1. And so we can build the functions F1, F2, F3. So if you remember here, so if we know T1, T2, or better, if we guess T1, T2, all the way to Tm minus 1, we can find, we can build F1, F2, F3, all the way, all the way to all the differential equa uh, algebraic equations. So we build the right-hand side. And then we find T1, T2, and T3, because we have F1, F2, and F3, and so on. So if we have a T1, T2, and T3, we can iterate because we find a new F1, F2, and F3. So for example, if you look at the temperature at 0.52, 52, that's an index 52, some location, generic location inside the domain. What happens to this temperature as we increase the number of iterations n? So this is a number of iterations. Well, the temperature will, in general, initially will be different from the actual solution. But as we progress with the iteration, then the temperature will drop and eventually will converge to the numerical solution. We can stop the iteration when we're happy. Happy means that we can define a sort of uncertainty or some error between the converged value and the actual solution. So when we're happy then this values does not change anymore, then we can, uh, we can say that we have reached our converged solution. We're happy with the, with what we have achieved. So in general, every methods are quite fast, are fast and direct methods, and M also can be quite large. The problem is with these iterative methods that rely, uh, as we have seen, on an initial guess. So this initial guess, the better the initial guess, so the closer the initial guess is to the actual solution, the better, because if the initial guess is not good, these methods uh, may not converge. So they might not lead to the actual uh, solution true solution. And so this concludes our discussion of numerical methods. Thank you very much and see you next time.